All right, good afternoon, everybody. Chris Lester here. Thank all of you for taking time out of your day to hop on this call. I wanted to do September as a life insurance awareness month. It's already been deemed that, but I wanted to spotlight it for a couple of different reasons, because I find that a lot of people don't really understand life insurance. They think they do. I can tell you that it's not the policies that your parents and grandparents own. A lot of things have changed, but it's a tool. It's just like anything. It can perform wonderfully if designed correctly. And it's like all insurance, right? We hate to pay for it, but thank God it's there should we need it. And the thing that, you know, I, I want to wish and make sure that everybody on this call, that you're safe, you're sound, your family's okay. Because, you know, I, you know, it's just upsetting. We had a really strong storm come through here last night here in New Jersey. And uh, nine people didn't wake up to that. I, I didn't know these nine people. But, you know, nobody ever expects today to be the last day on the planet. And it's just for, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And then we lost those 13 Marines last week. They're serving their country. and. There are brothers and sisters, and you just got to hug the ones you're with. And one of the biggest ways that we can say, I love you to people we care about is with life insurance. See, life insurance is not a product. It's not a commodity. It's not something that you, yeah, you can buy term, you have it through work and it's there. Hey, thank God I have it. But until you truly own it and where, you know, I have offensive amounts of life insurance. It's really a way to say to the people that are here when you're not, I love you and things are gonna be okay. Versus the alternative, I have a, uh, a client that was referred to me over in Pennsylvania that lost her husband at 58 years old. This guy's an ex-Marine, but he, um, he got a, I think it was a ALS is what he ended up passing away from. They were this close to finalizing the life insurance. And it's just woefully short. And now they're sitting back and she's wondering, what am I going to do with two kids? It really is scary. Enough of the lecture. I just wanted to just, you know, make sure that as you are thinking about this, it's never too late to get a second opinion, review what you have. Is it what you want? Does it work the way that you thought that it did? Was it designed correctly? There are so many little nuances that can be taken care of while we're able to versus should a crisis arise and then you find out this isn't what I wanted or how it works. So today we're going to talk about first, we're going to talk about these two topics. Swing versus club, where do we put money? So when we have money, discretionary income, we can put it in a multitude of places. And then I'll ultimately give you a 10 minute lesson on life insurance. I've done this before, but this was a case for a doctor that I did started last year and wrapped it up this year on what he elected to do and, and again anonymity and it's just the numbers are there all right so you know this here is a picture of something that i'll refer to it's called circle of wealth that big circle in the middle that says your circle of wealth we all have a circle of wealth you know some of you on this call you know may have more assets than me your circle is bigger than others others may be bigger than yours but we all have one thing in common when it comes to our circle of wealth and that's that we want it to grow at a bare minimum, we want it to stay the same size. What we don't want to have happen is for it to get smaller. We don't want to have unintended expenses or a loss of revenue at some point in time. So when I'm talking to folks, and as I'm getting to know them, I'll ask them, if you had some money, where would you tend to lean towards putting your money? And quite often what will happen is they'll start to pick areas. And I said, before you answer that question, let's say that the perfect investment existed and it had all these benefits. It had tax deferred growth, it had tax-free distribution, it had competitive returns. You could put in as much money or as little money as you wanted to. It has additional benefits. Maybe it has some uh, ability to be used as collateral. It's safe, so it wasn't subject to risk. Maybe if we had guarantees so we didn't lose money, guaranteed loan options. So if we needed access to this money, we could. If we did take money, I'd like to be able to determine my own payment structure. Liquidity, use and control. So having access to your money once you put it there 
them being able to use it and control it. And ultimately, if we can take it as a tax deduction, we'd be hitting on all cylinders. That's the perfect investment, right? Out of those 12, I can tell you the perfect investment does not exist. The last person that said that it did um, just passed away. That was Bernie Madoff and he went to prison. So when I ask somebody where they would typically put money, most people will lean towards stocks, right? Most people will lean towards some type of equity. And so let's look at what kind of benefits an equity might have. It, it might have tax deferred growth, depending on the environment that it was saved in. Yes, we definitely want to get some competitive rates of return. We can say, hey, the S&P over the last 100 years has averaged 10%. So people think that's an automatic high contributions. You can put as little or as much money into stocks as you want to. Collateral. So yes, you can assign or get margin accounts on it so you can buy more. Liquidity use and control. You know, I'll say yes here, but the liquidity feature, if the market's down, do you really want to sell it? And then deductible. Yeah, depending on the environment that it's in, that could be. Well, then the counter to that is the other side of that coin, which is bonds, right? In this case, tax-free bonds, right? Ooh, I want tax-free bonds. Well, Tax deferred growth in that case, yes. Tax free distributions, if they were tax free bonds, yes. High contribution limits, again, we could do that. Collateral opportunities, liquidity use and controls, deductible contributions. But I have spent the last four years cautioning about the bond arena, and I think I've made that point. This is probably not a place where most people are gravitating towards, especially in a rising interest rate environment. All right, so if stocks and bonds weren't on the table, what else? Well, everybody likes to pick real estate. Everybody wants to say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm buying that second home, vacation home. I wanna be a, a landlord. I wanna create passive income. I get it. So let's look at some of the benefits. Tax deferred growth, yeah. So if we, we buy that second home, we buy an investment piece of property, we can depreciate the property. We can then take that money that we're getting and we can create that income. But you know what I'm finding now is clients of mine that are 80 that were landlords for you know 20 years now have this puzzle where they have to get out of it. Competitive returns, that remains to be seen, but you can make some money if you buy and hold in real estate. So, you know, that's the one key factor. As long as you hold it through down to, downward turns or downward trends in the marketplace, you can actually uh, make money on the property you bought. I have an expression, real estate. They're not making any more of it. But you got to, you know, boom or bust. When do you do it? You know, now COVID is hit. Now real estate prices, you know, logic would dictate probably is now not the time to buy because prices are so high. And then high contributions. There are houses or buildings or, or real estate of all different capital uh, values that, that you could tap into. So out of 12, we get three with real estate. And it's, you know, just what I always say also is be careful what you wish for. Qualified plans. This is the one where, you know, if I'm pulling an audience, I'm in a classroom, uh, everybody will typically say, yeah, 401k. And I go, you know, 401k is a tax code. It's not necessarily an investment strategy, but let's look at some of the things that, that we can put within that 401k or in that, that arena. Tax deferred growth. Okay. Competitive returns. Okay. Safe. That one, um, you know, depending on what you pick, maybe you pick some CDs or money markets within that and you diversify. And yes, you do get the deduction. So as you can see here from the first four, right, that we start to, that the, the, the holy grail of, of investment options is rare, right? Where do we find something? We already know 12 doesn't exist. So what I find is nobody in all my career, and I've been doing this 30 years, Nobody ever picks cash value permanent life insurance. Nobody. But once I explain to them how it works, it's not whether you, you should or could have it. It's why do you want it? And you want it for what it can do. But it has to be properly structured and designed. Again, it's a tool that fills a need. And as you can see here, the only thing that we cannot get with permanent life insurance is you cannot take it as a tax deduction. The IRS is very clear that if you take a, a tax deduction on the left side of the column, you cannot get the benefit to you and your beneficiaries tax-free on the right side of the column. Okay, 
So now that we've gone over swing versus club, let's do the 10 minute lesson on life insurance. And it may be quicker than 10 minutes, but I just want you to get the gist. Because again, I know it's not typically the topic that everybody wants to talk about, but you should pull out your contract. You should check your beneficiaries. You should check the death benefit. Make sure this stuff is in place and that it's what you want and that you understand it and if you bought term and it was 10 years term and you're nine years into it or 20 years term and you're 18 years into it or you own term insurance through your employer, you don't own it. Your employer does. And now as soon as you retire, you no longer have life insurance. Then you go, well, now it's too expensive. So planning ahead is prudent. So these two sections of the code, 7702 and 72E, Properly structured cash value life insurance is afforded tremendous tax advantages if properly structured. But A, you have to qualify. And I don't want you to view this as an expense. I mean, that's the, the commercial you hear on the radio when you're driving around, you know, hey, you can get uh, life insurance for $20 a month if you're a 40 year old male. And, you know, okay, it's 10 year term. You bought it. And, you, you know, the, the thing I always say is that, you know, insurance companies, or in business to make money. And you should be thinking about the bet that typically most people are making when they buy term insurance. What you're basically saying is you're going against the house and 98% of all term policies never pay a death benefit. 98% of all term never pay a death benefit. The insurance companies know that. They're collecting all this premiums. That's why they can build these huge buildings in, in, in major cities. So you have to start to think to yourself, not as an expense, not the least amount of money I can buy. You know, Dave Ramsey does not understand this concept. And I get it. If you're, you're new, we're young, we don't have much, fine. I get it. I'm not going to argue it. But if you start having discretionary income, and again, you're looking for a place to put your money, I can start to show you why you want to consider this and why you should want to have another asset class, which is why I started off with swing versus club. So this here was the death benefit that the doctor, he and I worked with, and you know, he's 49 years old when we did this and uh, you know, he's making some money and he turned around and he goes, look, I'm putting money into my 401k and I just asked him a question. Do you think taxes in this country are going to be lower, the same or higher in the future? And without hesitation, he said higher. I said, if you honestly believe that in your core of core self, why would you defer taxation into an environment where you're knowingly, you know the taxes when that money come out are gonna be higher? It makes no sense mathematically. That stumped him and he was willing to listen. So we took our time, I went through and I started to peel back the onion. But here's the question I have for everybody. There is a minimum amount of premium that can go into a max funded contract, into a permanent life insurance. Does anybody on this call know who determines the minimum amount of premium? The minimum is determined by the insurance company. They say this is how much we need in order to be able to pay our, our, our bills, our staff, our expenses, everything we need. Who determines the, what's the most amount of money I can put in here? And that's the government. Well, the fact that the government is even remotely interested on how much cash you can put into a max funded life insurance contract should tell you one thing as it relates to taxes. And that's that it's good. So in this example, right, this was the death benefit for the minimum death benefit that the IRS says that we have to purchase in order to not mech the contract. What does mech mean? That stands for modified endowment contract. If you want some light reading, uh, Google that, right? Um, but mechs aren't necessarily bad. We just have to understand that when we're designing it, all that it means is if you put in more premium than the IRS allows within a given time period, then it works just like an IRA, 401k, SEP, or 403b. Basically, what it means is all your tax deferred growth now becomes 
you have to pay tax on it and a 10% penalty if you're uh, prior to age 59 and a half, right? Which negates the whole advantage of having property structure cash value uh, life insurance, which is why in this example, the minimum premium was a thousand. And then this gentleman here, because of his age, 39,673 for five years and he's done. So he's basically gonna put in his 200,000 the IRS says you have 11 years to put that in, but you can short pay it or pay it quicker. And that's what he elected to do here. And in doing so, he got all these benefits, tax deferred growth, tax free distribution. And now when he gets ready to retire at 65, 67, turn on Social Security. Remember, Social Security is not subject to taxation. You know, I said tax free bonds are not subject to taxation but social security triggers something called provisional income and muni bonds are uh, a trigger. So it's not completely tax free, but cash value life insurance is. Roth IRAs are, Roth 401ks are. So again, there's a lot of little strategies we can help uh, create for people, but this here I think gives us the, the most value and I let clients decide. So that's our 10 minute lesson on life insurance. There's our disclosures. What I would say is if you have questions, you'd like to see what this might look like for you. You want a second opinion, reach out to us, right? Or if you know somebody, right, that, that you say, hey, you know, they won't listen to me, but would you take a look? Could you, could you, you know, could you talk to them? Certainly. And, you know, as you know, we have quite often have other advisors on here. If you were uh, invited here by another advisor, then, then ask that advisor, we're here to help. But you know, this is Life Insurance Awareness Month. This is something that I, is a topic that because I've been doing this for 30 years, I've seen what happens when you can, when you plan properly and when you don't. And I don't like to leave things to chance. So again, I wanna wish all of you safe, healthy, wonderful day. Have a great Labor Day. If you need me, reach out and thank you all. Have a great day, bye-bye.